Jesus, and you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. And I prove that scripturally, and I believe I come up uh, in my mind beyond a shadow of doubt that in Romans chapter one is talking about a fool. Second Peter chapter two is talk, verse chapter Second Peter chapter two is talking about a fool also, and it's dealing also in Philippians about fools and a warning in the Word of God about us to be very careful in what we're doing. Because the Bible says an evil and a wicked generation seeketh after a sign. And if you look in the Bible, the Bible says, and the Bible says, talks about a perverse generation. And I proved last week that a fool is perverted in his way. And that's what this generation is. It's a generation that is a lover that pleasures more than lovers of God. And the Bible prophesied that. And that is the generation. We love pleasure. We want pleasure. We want everything that will please this flesh. In regard to whatever it was, that is this generation, and God absolutely condemns it. He said, we need to love God. Love righteousness, holiness, truth, the perfect word of God, and the perfect will of God in all things and in every way. So Second Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 18, I want to reread that before I get into this. And I'm going to point a few things out tonight on this. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 18 says, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure. There we go, that's a spirit of pleasure. To riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes. Sporting, notice that word, sporting. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings. Remember the word deceivings. While they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling. Remember that word, beguiling, unstable. So who's that, who's that sound? Like? Man, that sounds like talking about the devil. And all them were deceiving, beguiling, and just uh, all of that. Beguiling unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. That sounds like a serpent. He was cursed in the garden. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's mouth forbade the madness of the prophet. Verse 17. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Notice the darkness. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that will clean escape from them who live in air. And I'm just going to deal with this first part real briefly because I deal with it before in, in depth, I feel. And the Bible says, If any man among you seemeth to be religious, seemeth to be religious, and bridles not his own tongue, this man's religion is vain. Period. That's it. God makes it absolutely clear. And this is the great swelling words of vanity, all right? And that is one fruit that you can judge a man. And also, the Bible says, it comes in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. You can judge flat out by that, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth definitely does speak. And I'm just going to be real brief on, on this part. Because I dealt with it in depth one time. It was almost two years ago. A long time ago. I didn't realize it was that long when I was looking back, but it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. Because I want to get into another subject, another part of this. It says, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. No better than what? No better than serpent. So if you want to call a fool a dog, you can call a fool a serpent. Why? Because Jesus said, oh, you Pharisees and scribes, you are fools. And he said, oh, generation of vipers. Now, remember all them words in First Peter? Deceiver, beguiler. Who does that talk about? They talk about this serpent, that old deceiver, Satan himself. And I told you last time that a fool is a man filled with demons and the devil, and he's one of the most dangerous things walking upon the face of the earth, and it's absolutely true. And, I, and, and the reason it, 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 it boggles so many people's minds that they do not understand it is because a lot of times a fool does not even know that he's given over to that type of reprobate mind. And therefore he himself is deceived. And therefore he is so innocent in his seeming motivation. You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's the word. All, look at all major false doctrines that come into the, into the New Testament church. And everything. They come in through a lot of men that thought they were doing right. They actually believed that they were right men, and Satan used them to corrupt the truth. If you will study back, a lot of them did. A lot of them thought they were actually doing... Oh, he used a lot that didn't. But there's a lot of doctrines that come in through men that were just flat out deceived. But they never even realized in their deceiving. That's why the Bible says, in the latter days, deceiving and being deceived, not even knowing that they're corrupted. That's why so many people, that's why I don't judge nothing by sincerity. I judge it by the fruit of the Spirit according to the Word of God. And that's the only thing Jesus said. He said, by their fruits you shall know them, period. All righty. 
So Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 11 through 14 says, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. That's an interesting phrase to study out. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be after him, who can tell him? So it's full of words. And the Bible says also, keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of the Lord, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of the fool, for they consider not that they do evil. In the Bible after that, in the same, this is Ecclesiastes. I'm not going to tell you where these scriptures are tonight, because I don't want you turning all, all of them. I'm going to leave a little thing in the back on the scriptures. If you want them, and you can look at them. I'm just going to tell you. It's in the Word of God, and I'm going to write them down. You can look at them later. Some of them I'm going to give out. But, but I will, I'll lose your attention if you're constantly turning to the scriptures. And so uh, some of them I'll say turn to, and the rest I'm just going to quote, tell you in the scripture, and I'll leave a little thing back on the table if you want the scriptures, and you can look at them afterwards. It's just going to save a little bit of time. All righty? So, now I told you that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 says, I want to read verse number 3. I was just on that one. Verse 3. For a dream coming through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitudes of words. And what kind of words? Great swelling words of vanity. What kind of words? Words of vanity. Words of meaningless. Words that will appeal only to your flesh. Not words to edify and lift up and grow in the body of Jesus Christ, but only words to appeal to your flesh, words to bring pleasure, words in some way to please your flesh. What? I'm talking about jesting and joking. I want you to turn with Proverbs chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. So I just want to hit on this one real briefly, and this is about the last one I'm going to do. Because... I'm going to tell you what this is, and uh, I tell you, this scripture, people just don't want to, I don't know why people don't want to believe this scripture, but they don't want to believe this is the word of God. This one scripture, I, there is such a spirit of rebellion against this one scripture, it's because people are so ingrained to the flesh, walking in the flesh for so many years that they refuse to yield to God's precious word. But this scripture says, as a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? He deceives. He lies to his neighbor and says, I'm just joking. And the Bible says that man is a man that casts firebrands, arrows, and death. Now you tell me who came to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, it happened right here where I've seen somebody tell somebody, Go and get something in a certain place, full well knowing it was not in a certain place. The person comes back, and this was a boy. Now, this is a boy comes back and, and says, it's not there. Mama, he lied to me. Now, did he lie? Come on, was it a lie? Was it a lie? He knew it wasn't there, and he said it was a lie. Does the Bible say? It's a deceiving spirit. And that spirit from hell, the Bible says that Satan is the father of all lies, and Satan is a deceiver. You know, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, you are your father, the devil, the lust of your father you shall do. He was a liar from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. And he is a father of liars. And they come forth from him. And he is a deceiver. Now I want to talk a little bit. That only appeals to the flesh. That type of stuff only appeals to the flesh. A man that... Now, now the problem is now they're brothers that laugh with that kind of junk. You know what I'm saying? A man that can laugh with that tongue, you are partaker of the evil deeds and you shall be destroyed according to the word of God. It just makes no difference. You know what I'm saying? You've got nothing spiritual love for God to stand in truth and stand for righteousness, and you deserve to be destroyed if you don't have enough love in your heart and mind for the Word of God, the Spirit of God, for holiness. We are fighting a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, and we've got to be victorious. We must be victorious in our ways and in our stance. Now, this appeals only to the flesh, but that does not... Now, I want to say something. You say, well, oh, fools, just their mouth is out of control. Their mouth is out of control, but it's in 100% control. It's out of their control, but it's in the control of Satan. This is, what, this is what fools so many Christians, and whoever they are, ministers or whatever, because they do not realize, ah, just no harm, it's just, a, it's just some harmless stuff. But they do not realize that when a person is out of control, they don't have self-control, they cannot control their tongue, then they have yielded themselves to the control of Satan, and Satan is in full control. And when he is in full control, you are talking about a wise individual. I don't care what you say, but Satan is wise. He has had 6,000 years of experience 
how to trip up men and how to lead them into sin. And he knows what he's doing. That's why it's one of the hardest spirits to deal with. That's why it gets in so many churches. It causes confusion, causes frustration, causes strife, causes envying, causes misunderstanding, and a hundred one others. And people don't even know what's coming on, don't even know where it's coming from and where it is going to. And that's the truth. Why? Because it is that type of spirit. Now, Romans chapter 1, I'm just going to, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to read some scripture. You know, I talked to a brother a little bit about, about, about ministering the Word of God. And I'll tell you what happens. You know, when you're preparing a, sermon, a message or a sermon for the Word of the Lord, you know what you use? I was talking about the uh, armor of God. You know what you use? You use your shield of faith constantly while you're preparing your message. You know what I'm saying? You gird your loins about truth, you use your shield of faith. Why? Because you're preparing. You're, you're approaching. You're advancing unto the enemy in spiritual warfare, but you have not, now listen to me, you who are preachers, if you are going to be effective in ministering the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and let His Word accomplish the work, your only offensive weapon that you have in your armament, basically, is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. All right? Are you with me? So when you're preparing and advancing, Satan fires his fiery darts when you're still out of distance, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards. So you use your shield of faith. All righty? But if you're going to get at that enemy, and if you're going to do some damage to the kingdom of darkness, you're going to have to get close enough to that enemy. You're going to have to get right in the territory of the devil. You're going to have to expose the works of darkness for exactly what they are and get specific and name it. And that is the only way. Because that sword of the spirit is no good if your enemy is over five or six feet away from you. You've got to track down, so to speak, if I can say, or rush into the battle with the sword of the Spirit and get close enough. See, that's why so much preaching is ineffective today. Hey, ministers don't get in. And I'm just saying that because some of the brothers, amen, that are new in preaching and stuff, you're going to have to learn that. If you are going, and, and the one thing Jesus did is destroy the work of darkness. That's one of the one major things he did. And if you are going to destroy the works of darkness, you're going to have to get into the hand-in-hand -hand combat with these spiritual powers and principalities. There is no other way. See, so many miss, oh, shield of faith. They just hold back with the shield of faith constantly. No, you've got to get in there with the Word of God. It's the only thing that'll do it. I just want to throw that to some of your brothers, because it, 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 and you're going to take your lumps. You're going to get battered a little bit. You're going to get bruised. Amen. I get bruised. Ah, that's all right. I get bruised. I lose some battles, but I'm going to win the war. With the grace of God, I'm going to win the war, and that's what matters. You know what I mean? If you're afraid to get bruised and battered, you, you might as well just quit, quit it. You might as well quit before you start it. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 6. I want to read something. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither, will be, neither were they thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations. This is the one I was talking about, fools. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. Alrighty? Notice what it said. Their foolish heart was what? Darkened. Ecclesiastes says, the fool walketh in darkness. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. He's saying a fool is walking in the kingdom of darkness. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you get the understanding of the scripture what the Bible is saying you're up against with that type of thing? It's very, very easy. So Matthew chapter 6 verses 22 through 23. Remember, darkness. Foolish heart was darkened. And it says, the light of the body is the eye. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, then he goes on to say. If thine eye be single, what is that single talk? It's talking about single eye, single purpose, but also talking about a clear, a clear eye. Hey, do you know you can tell a lot about looking at a person's eyes? The truth. You know, Proverbs says, the eyes of a fool are in the end of the earth. It says, a wise man's eyes are in his head. That makes sense. A wise man's eyes are in his head. The eyes of the fool are in the end of the earth. What are you talking about? He's got a wandering eye. He's got a lustful eye. That's exactly what he's saying. A lust oh, how do we say that? Wantonness? Wantonness? 
Walking wantonness. There's a wantonness. There's a lustfulness. There's a, there's a looking around. Now, do you hear me? Remember back in Peter when I'm talking about it? It says, having eyes full of what? Adultery. Ah, you're talking about a fool. Ah, adultery. Yeah, that's right. Eyes full of adultery. There's an adulterous spirit a long time that goes with foolishness. Now, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye, does not proceed from the Father, it's from the world. The lust of what? The eye. What are you saying? The lust that proceeds from the eye. The lust of the eye. There's a lust that comes from the flesh, but there's a lust which proceeds from the eye. Now listen for a minute. Do you understand me? In other words, there's a lust that proceeds forth from the eye. In other words, demons can work through eyes. And I'm going to prove this in a second. They can actually, spirits, can go out through a person's eyes, the spirits of lust, and they can provoke a lust in another person's heart and mind. If that person is not under the scriptural covering and authority of God in his precious word, and not walking in wisdom. Now, I'm going to prove this in a minute, all right? But I just want to say, Jesus made a statement. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her in his heart has committed dealt with her already in his heart. To lust after her, why? What he's saying is a man that looketh upon a woman to lust after her, and this is the truth, and if you watch, you watch, you can see this, he will cast his spirit of lust out to that woman. Come on, anybody in the world, and you know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to prove scripturally, he cast the spirit of lust out to that woman. And so, as far as he's concerned, he's made the invitation and saying, hey, I'm available, let's commit adultery. All righty? Now, the old, he's committed already in his heart. The spirit done did went out to that woman. Now, the woman can stop it by two means, either one, not seeing it, or rejecting it. All right, now I'm going to get to some. How to repulse the spirit of lust for the women. Turn with me to... Uh, First John, I mean First Timothy, chapter two, verses nine to eleven. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hey, that can't be. Hey, they, there are people that hypnotize people with their eyes. That's a spirit that's going forth, and and spirits can go through your eyes, go through your mouth, through your words. They can go in many other ways too. Spirits can be given through laying on the hands, and that means the spirit of God in the right. Remember when Peter and John were in the temple, they fastened their eyes on that man, and they say, Hey, look on up. Why? What? He wanted eye contact. Because when that man looks up and sees in their eyes, he's seen the power and the holiness of God. He's seen the healing Christ in the midst of them. And when he fastened eyes on them and they fastened on him, he locked. He said, oh, man, there's something in them, boys, that's coming out. And it was the healing power of God that entered into a thing. And the same way, that's why the Bible talks about they, they take him with their eyelids. And also talks about, hey, when I'm talking about food, I'm not talking about men. I'm talking about women. To also, you know, they take him with their eyelids. You know what I'm saying? Don't let her take you know, it's, that's it. Why? Because she casts forth that spirit of lust with her eyes. Believe me, it, it, it is very, very... And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something in a minute. So First Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. So you can tell all you got to do is sometimes watch. Man, you just watch a person, watch your eyes. Because fool has eyes full of adultery. Watch how it looks upon women. You can see the spirit of lust casting forth. You know what I'm saying? It's very, very... Simple. God doesn't want us ignorant. Amen. First Timothy chapter two, verse nine to eleven. In like manner also, now listen to this: that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. All right. Now I'm verse nine again. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. What's that? That's the first thing that stops that spirit of lust. Their modest apparel does not give any opening. Because if, now listen to me, because if a woman has something in modest or top slow, you know what I'm saying, where a man can see in there, you know what I'm saying, he, if he's got the spirit of lust, he will zero in and look at that, and he will let that be known to the woman that he's looking at that. You know what I'm saying? And therefore she has already given, in a certain sense, into that spirit, because you can open a door. You know what I'm saying? And it's difficult for her then to rebuff that. And then also notice, every one of these things that are listed for women is for one reason. In this scripture here, it is to stop the spirit and for that woman to rebuff any spirit of lust that may come her way. The next thing, shamefacedness. Wait, we're doing those things with modest, but with shamefacedness. What is shamefacedness? I'll tell you what it really comes from. It means, it com means shamefacedness. When a person is ashamed, they cast their eyes down. That's exactly what it means. And it comes from the word casting down of your eyes. Alrighty, and there's something for you women, you know what I'm saying? And I'll just teach you, you know why? Because we were warned right before Brother Stair, go right down on that land. He warned us. He talked about that familiar spirit. He talked about the family, you know what I'm saying? That was, that was, there was 
trying to be broken apart. You know what I mean? He talked about that. He warned us about that familiar type of spirit. You know what I mean? Flat out told us to be careful of it. You know what I'm saying? And so this is what. Now listen to me, women. So if this is how you can keep yourself from even being hindered by that spirit. Keep your shame facedness. Let your eyes basically, when you're talking, let your eyes have that shame face. Let your eyes be toward the ground. Don't make connection with that spirit of lust. Do you understand what I'm saying? Keep your eyes shamefacedly toward the ground, and you will not connect with that spirit of lust. You know what I'm saying? You will not have to be bothered with it. You will not have to see it. God, this is God's way of trying to keep it, and we need it in our day and our time. We need it in our day and our time. All right? It's God's way of trying to keep you. And another thing with shamefacedly and sobriety, any time you open up and start getting a little bit uh, jovial, jovial type, and a little bit of foolish, and, and that's silly. You know, remember, it talks about leading captive silly women laden with that lust. So if you're sober and sobriety with shamefacedness and modest apparel, you're rebuffing that spirit on every count in every manner that it comes against you. And that's what the Bible says. And also, not with broided hair. You don't have some fancy hairdo. Why? Because this spirit is looking for any comment it can do just to talk to you. That's what it's doing. The spirit of lust looks at any door it can do to start a conversation that is in some way going to somehow please and puff up the flesh or move to the flesh. Oh, you... can do to start a conversation that is in some way going to somehow please and puff up the flesh or move to the flesh. Oh, you hair looks so beautiful today. No man should be saying that kind of stuff to another man's wife or any single woman at all. There is no way t stuff like that or anything, the gold, the pearls, the costly ray, it all is to draw attention and to provoke and to bring out that spirit of lust. But when a woman is modest apparel, she dresses simply, modestly, nicely, it rebuffs. There is no way, hardly, that a man can let that spirit of lust go out. And this is why God is dealing, and this is why this is in the Word, Word of the Lord. And then it's a silent spirit. And I'm just going to tell it this way. This is true. There is no reason for our men to be conversing a lot with the women. That's just it, period. And I'm, t you know, now I don't care if you believe it or not, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with my family. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been warned. When he stepped, when Brother stepped off that land, he warned, you know what I'm saying? And I've been warned. And so I'm going to tell you what. If you ain't got anything good to say with my wife, don't even speak to her. We'll be friendly. We'll talk and everything. But there's no word men, to, women converse with the women. And he mentioned that. Didn't he mention that on that land down there before he left? He talked about you women conversing with you women. And us men conversing with our men. We don't need the women conversing with the men and the men conversing with the women. So just let it be known. If you have something so important to, to tell my wife, if you're a man or any other thing, you have something so important you got to tell her, you come tell me about it. I'll get the message over her. There's just no sense. And vice versa, if I got something so important to your wife, I mean, if we're, if we're in this group, like we're here in the dining room, I all read fellowship, that's fine. Presence, you have no problem. But to go off and talk with a woman alone, forget it. Forget it. Out of the presence of your wife, forget it. It is not right. It's not correct. There is no spiritual reason and need for that type of thing to be done. Now, I'm saying whatever you do is your business, but now you know uh, me and my house, we're going this way. You know what I'm saying? If you have anything that important, you just come to me. And if I got anything that important, I need to tell you. Well, I'm going to tell you. You know, you, in the, even when we're here after church, you can tell church, we're all right here. You know what I'm saying? But I don't on the ground or anything like that. Also, too, I told my wife, did, did, you know, we've been warned. There ain't no way that women, men, men and women should be out there one or two or three or four working alone in them fields together working together out there in the fields we're crazy that's going to cause trouble you know, we already hit upon it last year it already began to, it's going to cause trouble we got to be very careful of that you know what i'm saying so you brothers i'm going to say the same thing tonight my wife's out there working in that field with other women you can go out and work in that field but you just work on the other side you know what i'm saying but i said well, so i'm not going to go out there and work with your wife or any of you single young women out there alone i ain't going to do it i'm not going to work out here with that you in that field that that's stupid that is inviting, the Bible says, lead us not into temptation, that's inviting to temptation. You say, well, you don't trust us. I don't trust myself. Just like Brother Stair said, he don't trust me on the beach, I don't trust him on the beach, he don't trust none of us on the beach. I don't trust myself with some of the, no, 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 out there alone with, yeah, no, 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 no. The carnal mind, the flesh, no, 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 no. The Bible says, lead us not into temptation, don't enter into it. It said, lead us not into it. So that's just a wise thing. Now, what you do is your business. But you know, me and my house, we're going to do this, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm going to be very careful. Why? Because you women, the Bible says you are my sisters and treat you as sisters, but also be very careful. I'm going to be very careful, you know what I'm saying? That's why, you know, I, I don't hate any women, you know? I just don't hardly say very much a lot. Of, you know, that very few, I'm very safe, just a little, a little bit, a little bit. Why? Because there's no reason for me. Do you understand that? I get fellowship with the brothers, good fellowship with the brothers. No problem about that. If there's something that's that needful, you know, do it in a cry. Do it in, like, say, here, or if we need to talk or whatever. But otherwise, there just ain't no reason. 
And now, you know a way to rebuff that spirit of lust. And the same with the man. When, when a woman's casting her eyes at the man, same thing. A man just turn away, walk away. Just turn his eyes away to rebuff that spirit. The same way a man can rebuff the spirit. Because I'm telling you, the Bible says a foolish woman is clamorous. She is loud and stubborn. She abideth not in her house. It's talking about a harlot. It says she has led many good men down. And so we've got to be careful on both lines. So we're not talking about just that. All righty. I'm going to go on down. You remember something Brother Stair said? Remember what happened to him when he was in Russia? Now, I'm telling you, you can tell a lot about a person's eyes. You can look in a person's eyes and tell a lot about them. Sometimes I meet a believer, and I know they're a believer just by looking at their eyes. Just that quick. First contact. A believer. Just like that. Just looking in their eyes. Why? There's a clearness. You look in the eyes of, of, of wicked people, ungodly people, the, 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 there's a darkness. There's a confusion. You know what I'm saying? And uh, a lot of times you can just tell by looking in their eyes. Remember what Brother Stair said when we went to Russia? What, what did he have to do to them elders there? He had to give him a kiss. The kiss wasn't the test. You know what the elders do? When he was coming close with the kiss, they were checking his eyes out. Yes, they were. They were peering right into his eyes. They were saying, what's in the soul of this man? They were looking at us. The kiss didn't mean nothing. You know what I'm saying? It was the eye contact. They were checking. Why? Because he said they kissed him and they looked eye to eye. If I remember, isn't that how he said it? I think that's how he said it. They were just, when they're when they getting close, they looked right in his eyes. Ah, oh, they seen the clearness. They seen the singleness. They said, okay. Amen. That's what they're doing. Checking out his eye. You see, when I was in Argentina, the Lord told me in this one church, there's a witch in this church. And I says, all right. And so then, you know, you don't know who it is, so you got to kind of find it out. You know what I mean? And that's why I talk about you get close with the Word. And so the Lord just happened to, you know, I prayed about what's ministry. He just happened to minister about the women being in, in, in submission. You know what I'm saying? And the authority and the covering of, of God that God's given to women. And so when I was preaching, and I could sense where, where, where it was at. There was a mother and a daughter right over there, and I just kept preaching. You know? Because when you're preaching, you watch the Word of God go out. Why? You watch the resistance. You watch other things. And you could look at people's eyes, and you can tell where that spirit is in the congregation. You, you can do it with the Word of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? God's Word is the discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. It is there. And so I perceived, and I could sense it was right there. It was that mother and daughter. But I didn't know whether it was one or both. And I, I, and I thought, man, it, it, it's probably that mother. You know, but I couldn't tell. You know, and then I just watched more and I preach it, and, and it wasn't the mother. It was, because, but because there was a fear on the mother, and I thought, she fears God's word, you know what I'm saying? And there was a fear on her, but then I looked and I saw that the, the face of the daughter, there, she was, she, there was a little fear on her face, but her face was almost, I want to use the almost like a cat. She was almost like a cowering, like a cowering, face. and her eyes were, there was just kind of a blackness, you know what I'm saying? And at first I thought it was the mother, but it wasn't. It was the daughter. And then we went to a little prayer meeting, because this is a place I ministered two or three times. And I'm, you know what I mean, saying? And, after the, and, then I, I, and then we went to a little prayer meeting, and sure enough, this, this woman was there, all righty? And so we were just praying and praying. And one time I just got up and I looked from prayer, and sure enough, she was just staring right at me. Just staring, just boom. Right like that. And I looked right, and I saw it. I, I knew right there. See, and, and I could see a spirit of almost, uh, you could see the darkness. But there was almost like a raging, but there was almost like a fear. Because I don't know what she saw, but she knew she couldn't touch me. I could sense that God had put a covering around me. She couldn't touch me for that. But there was a raging in her heart. There was almost like a raging, because that, 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 that spirit that was in her wanted to get at me. You know what I'm saying? Because of God's word. You know what I'm saying? And so God, and I could just tell right by her eyes, it was just, just that, that, that made it just abs absolutely clear. But there was a spirit of raging, and I want to get into that now. The spirit of raging. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Since we're right there, verses 7 through 9, we're going to turn. Spirit of raging. And you know what was raging inside of her? It was the demons. Why? Why? Because they raged at Christ. They raged at Him. Satan rages at God. Satan rages at God. You hear what I said? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 7 through 9 says, Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. There is one reason for being mad. There's one reason for being angry. Oppression. When you see somebody be oppressed, you ought to be angry if you're a wise man. You ought to be angry. When you see somebody wrongfully oppressed, you ought to get angry about it. That ought to be something turning your soul. If you can laugh when somebody else is getting oppressed, you do not have the Spirit of God in you. You do not have wisdom in you. Because God's Spirit is a Spirit that reaches out to the fatherless and those who are being oppressed. He's the one that, that will reach out to them. But so, why, oppression does make a wise man man. That's why the Bible says in Matthew, the Lord talked about, he said, uh, uh, Be not angry with thy brother without a cause. There is a cause, but there's one cause, oppression. 
Oppression. When you see somebody being oppressed, you ought to get a little angry. You ought to be a little upset about it. You ought to be a little mad about that somebody is oppressing the Son of God or the image of God that was created. There ought to be some kind of little uh, anger in your heart, you know what I mean, in the aspect that that, that oppression is unrighteousness, all righty? And so Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16 says, A fool's wrath, listen to this, is presently, no, here's a fruit of the fool, their wrath, their anger. It's presently known, and that means it is, it is continually manifest, or it is daily shown forth. Fool's wrath is daily shown forth. Now, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth, rageth. Oh, and is confident, raging, there it is. An angriness, a, a wrathfulness, uh, tells you, a, a, amen. He, verse 7, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. So he that is soon angry dealeth what? Foolishly. So there's a way you can tell. Soon angry. All righty. And now I want to go on down to uh, Psalms chapter 74, verse 18 through 22. And remember what Proverbs chapter, uh, Psalms chapter 7, 74 and I'm going to read another scripture. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. You know what that fretteth means? I told it before. It means to boil up and to be angry. So what is he doing? He, is he raging at? No. His real means is he's raging at God. Something inside of the fool that hates God. I told you in Romans chapter 1 that there's a hater of God. He hates God. What is it? What could it be that would cause a man to hate God? But all the time professing to know God and professing to be wise and professing to serve God. He's like the Pharisees were professing to know and serve him. And Jesus said, you hate me. So he hates God. What is it? It's the spirits in them. It's the spirits that rage against God, and they know they can't touch God. So what do they turn to? They turn to whatever they can rage against. And the number one next weapon, the number one next target they got is man. Because man is created in the image of God. And especially the sons of God. Because they are partakers of the divine nature. They are partakers of the divine nature. And that's why he zeroes in on Psalms chapter 74, verses 18 through 22. He zeroes in on Psalms chapter 74, verses 18 through 22. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached thee, O Lord, O Lord, hath reproached. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. They blasphemed the name of God. O deliver not the soul of the, thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of habitations of cruelty. The dark places. A fool walketh in what? He's got a cruel heart. Because the Bible talks about wrath being cruel. And I want to show you something. Oh, let not the oppressed return to shame. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches thee daily. Not reproaches, reproaches God. They reproach God. They're angry against God. They're out to blaspheme the name of God. Now, the Bible says, in the mouth of a foolish, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of, but know it? Pride. Pride. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. And that's why, that's the same thing that brought Satan down in the beginning. He was pride. He said, I will. Now, notice this is a rod of pride. What is the rod of pride? What is a rod here? This rod is a rod to beat people with. A fool uses his anger spiritually to beat people. And it's a rod of pride. It comes from pride. The root is pride. And that's where it comes from. Because the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. And the Bible says in another scripture, an angry man stirreth up strife, and also he aboundeth in transgression. He stirs up strife, and that, that's contention. And it only comes by what? Pride. You see how these all fit together? They all fit together just to show and to reveal it. You know what I'm saying? You know, I've heard people use God's names in vain. 
saying they're believers, they're Christians, just boom, flat out, use God's name in vain, on this land, in vain. God's name in vain. The Bible says, no man. Now, why would Paul write that in Corinthians? You would think everybody would know. He said, no man calls Jesus a curse by the Holy Ghost. Because he even had that problem in the Corinthian church. All these spiritual tongue talking and people with divine revelations and holiness, you know what I'm saying? And, and somebody was sitting there cursing the name of God. And Paul's saying, hey, you ought to know that. That's not of the Spirit of the Lord. They were even willing to overlook that, taking God's name and cursing it in vain to try and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're still good and you're still all right. No, 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 no. Ain't no man called by that. Oh, that's, that's the spirit of darkness. That's always the spirit of darkness. That's the spirit of unrighteousness. Now, I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 3. Now, we, we, we talk, you know, it's, we've been said a lot here that, now, I ain't said it necessarily, but I've heard it said here, that there's always a heaviness. There's a lot of heaviness here. Anybody ever heard that here? There's a lot of spirit of heaviness. I wonder why. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 3. I mean, who knows? We'll, we'll see. There's a lot of reasons, maybe. What does it say? A stone is heavy and sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier, heavier than them both. Heavier. Oh, come on, Kirk. Can that be true? It's the Word of God. Does the Word of God say it's true? Amen. Is there a heaviness amongst foolishness? Yes, there is. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Another scripture talks about a fool being the heaviness of his father. It's bitterness to them that bear him. There's a spirit of heaviness that comes with foolishness. You think, man, there should come a spirit of, of rejoicing, a spirit of, I mean, hey, you're always joking, laughing, and all this stuff. There ought to be a... No, but look at the anger. Look at the depression. Look at the right of pride. Look at the contention. Look at the strife. That always comes from that pride and that anger. Always comes from it. Why? That's going to bring a heaviness. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because you're not going to get God's best by being deceived. You know what I'm saying? By appealing to the flesh, working in the flesh, seeking to please your flesh, you will never get the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is in the presence of the Lord, and He doesn't, he doesn't dwell amongst that kind of garbage. And as long as you keep abiding by that kind of garbage, you'll never get the presence of God, the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, the love of Christ into your soul. You know what I'm saying? And that's why you always will have a heaviness. Always. Always. You'd think, you think it would produce, uh, man, a flippant light type of spirit. Yeah, but anybody with any sense, that, that, that lightness is gone when the joke is ended. And that if any man's got any spiritual mind at all, or any type of desire to live for God, his own soul condemns him immediately. Condemnation comes in heaviness, you know, for two reasons. And I'm not going to get into that right now. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13. Now remember, anger, anger is a sign. Hey, has anybody seen it? I've sat in the dining room, and all of a sudden, somebody comes up with a wrath. And just a spirit of heaviness just drops over the whole place. Happens quite a bit. A spirit of heaviness. And that is not the wrath of God. That's the wrath of man that does not work God's righteousness. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've been in a lot of situations where you see that wrath come in heaviness. Anybody ever experienced that? Anybody ever seen that? The word of God is true. Thank God for his truth. You know, what should we, should we be, you just don't let that heaviness come on. When I see stuff like that, I say, wow, praise God, God's word is true. Amen, that may cause a heaviness in the air, but it ain't going to cause it in my soul, because I'm going to rejoice, because I'm seeing the living, true word of God coming to pass. Therefore, I'm just going to rejoice in my heart. I'm going to rejoice and praise God. God, you're true, you're wise, you sure know everything, don't you, Lord? Amen, everything I see in your word is true, isn't it, Lord? Yeah, it's true. You just keep reading it, keep studying, there's more in there. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly right. And that's the way you look at it. Amen. You just got to keep yourself holy and right and pure. Now, we warned about anger about two years ago. And since that time, I've seen that spirit of heaviness come down a number of times. And we just need to be careful. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13. But we need to understand why these things occur. Amen. Why? So we can save ourselves. Amen. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is what? Oh, you mean end of, end of mirth? Fun? Pleasure seeking? Having a good time? The end of that mirth is heaviness? Yes, it is. See, the scripture's true. Yeah, but what's the end of prayer? Seeking God, getting in the presence of the Lord. Joy, peace, love, power, faith, righteousness. Amen. A free soul, rejoicing, worship. The Bible doesn't say rejoice in the flesh. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Have joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. That's what the Bible says, and that's where it's got to be. And the reason being, and I'm about done with a couple of scripture. You see, the reason that Satan possesses fools it's because the Bible says, in your patience, possess your soul. And the scripture says, a, a man that hath a rule over his own spirit is better than a mighty man which taketh city. 
a little bit of paraphrase there, but that's exactly what he's saying. Better than a man that takes a city. All right? And the Bible told us in the end of time, especially, he says, in your patience possess your soul. All right? And the reason the fool does not have control over his own soul or his own life, and he's a yielded vessel to the, to the devil, is because he's lost his patience. I just showed you all the scripture where it says he's angry. Notice, he no longer possesses his soul. Do you understand that? That's just simple. He has given his soul. He has sold out his soul to work iniquity, as the Bible says, selling your soul to work iniquity. And it's just scripturally there. And that's why the Bible, because in your patience, possess your soul. And now, that spirit seeks that spirit. Now, we're talking about spirit, because we don't wrestle flesh and blood. We wrestle principalities, powers, the rulers of the dark of this world, and spiritual weakness in high places. Honey. And the reason... See, that spirit seeks to wear out the patience of the saint. Why? Because you can't do nothing to it. Because I'm going to read two more shoes. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar amongst pedestals, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. So you can't change him. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, though he rage, though he laugh, there is no rest. Last scripture, Psalm 37. Chapter 37, verse 7. Did you hear it? There's no rest. And the Bible says if you rebuke a wicked man, you get to yourself what? A block. And if you reprove a scorner, you get to yourself shame. You see what I say? And this is what that spirit will do. What a spirit wants you to do, if Satan's not stupid, he's sitting there watching, he's saying, man, there's a righteous man there, he knows that's unrighteousness. I'll get him to rebuke it. Well, you think, boy, that would, should be what a righteous man does, is rebuke, rebuke a scorner, or rebuke a wicked man, or rebuke a fool. You ought to do it. No, you don't do it. The Bible says don't do it. Because if you do it, that spirit's got you to do just exactly what he wants you to do. He's got you to disobey the word of God. See, that spirit, the one...